So today, as I walk you through some stuff on the next slide, uh, this is where I want to take you. We're going to talk a little about prophecy that we see in uh, the end of Luke's chapter 2. We're going to talk about yearbooks. Uh, we're going to talk about becoming in 2018 and who are we becoming and why and how. Uh, we're going to talk about what can we expect as those who follow Jesus and then want to talk about yes uh, when we get there. But first, let me tell you a little about uh, what happened uh, that we know of, at least that we have record of, between Jesus' birth and his adulthood? And the short answer to that is, not much. <laughs> we don't have a lot. Uh, in the canonical scriptures, which are the ones that show up in your Bible, uh, very little. Uh, in fact, I'm going to read pretty much all we have uh, about what happened to Jesus uh, after he was born until he was somewhere around 36 years old uh, when he started his ministry. Uh, somewhere in there, in that ballpark. Um, there are some non-canonical things out there that talk about Jesus' boyhood uh, that didn't make the cut of the Bible because they didn't quite pass muster. <laughs> they talked about things like Jesus slaying dragons and stuff like that, and stuff that was not congruent theologically or historically, and so they didn't make the cut. That's why we have what we have, is there was some confidence that these things rang true. Uh, with the actual story of Jesus and the theology uh, that he espoused. But I do want to read you what we have because it's pretty interesting. So uh, here we go. Eight days later after Jesus' birth, this isn't on the screen, uh, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord which is not very far from Bethlehem. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now the sacrifice that they offered to commemorate this thing tells us something about Mary and Joseph. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons was what you would offer if you had very little money. If you were really poor, this is what you did because it didn't cost much. So it's just another reminder <laughs> that the world and the parents and family that Jesus started life with was extremely poor. And it really didn't get any better. Uh, over the course of his life, he understood harsh, harsh poverty. Son of a carpenter who didn't make squat, uh, became a carpenter himself, didn't make squat, living under uh, the Roman Empire who made sure things stayed that way. Uh, the reason why you hear him... Um, talking so fondly of the poor is because he knew them because he was one. Uh, and that's how it all began. Well, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. At that point, point uh, Mary took Jesus back and said, Hey, creep, what are you doing with my kid? Well, maybe not, but anyway, <laughs> that's kind of a weird thing that happens. And it gets a little weirder. So Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, and I actually put this uh, in your guide today. He said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pier pierce your very soul. Isn't that a wonderful thing to tell a mother of an eight-year-old child? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's awful, right? I mean, this, this is never going to make a Hallmark card. Uh, and so we're reminded here that Luke is wanting to do a couple things. He's wanting to give us an illusion uh, to what is going to happen, not an illusion, an allusion to what's going to be taking place in Jesus' life. Uh, if we just go with the story, he's wanting to give Mary a clue what's going to take place. 
Because if Mary was like a lot of us, thinking, oh, well, God is with this child and so many things have happened, this is going to be quite a ride, it's going to be awesome, what could possibly go wrong uh, when things start to come off the bus, when the wheels start to come off the bus, she might wonder, is it even possible that God was in this thing at all? So for her to hear a heads up right from the beginning, uh, this is going to be a tough road. It's going to be great, but it's going to be hard at the same time. It was probably very helpful later on. Well, it goes on. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. Uh, she was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee, where the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Now, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. A lot of people did. This was a huge festival in Israel and in, in Jerusalem. So when Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Now this is how it can read. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done to this stuff to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But I think it probably sounded more like this. Son! <laughs> Why have you done this to us, your father? And I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. I mean, that's more likely, right? I mean, if you're a parent, your kid's been gone three days. You don't know if he's dead or alive, which is very interesting. Now, Jesus says, he kind of gives this lame excuse, but why would you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know I, would, I must be in my father's house? Yeah, play the God card, Jesus. Real nice. Uh, but seriously, this is interesting stuff. Now, Luke's purpose in giving us this story is simply to say, there's something special about this kid. How many 12-year-olds want to hang out with a pastor that long? <laughs> Nobody wants to hang out with a pastor that long, but, but there he is, hanging out with people who like to talk theology and stuff. Uh, so that's the purpose of it, but also realize that if we just take it at face value, uh, a major foul was just committed on Jesus' part. Sometimes we so glorify Jesus and so perfect him, we don't allow him to be human. Jesus, essentially, just broke one of the top ten commandments in dishonoring his father and mother. Even though he may not have said out loud to Joseph and Mary, I dishonor you, father and mother, by staying here. The action was dishonorable. And he knew it. And anybody reading this would know it. Uh, even today, in our day and age of connectivity, if a 12-year-old 12 12 -year does not tell his parents, <laughs> oh, hey, I'm just going to be hanging out wherever for, for three days and not, not tell them at all, they know there's, there's going to be a price to pay. Uh, certainly, certainly, uh, this, was, uh, this was a bad, bad move on his part. So, <laughs> then he returned to Nazareth with them, his parents, and was obedient to them, probably because he heard about it all the way back to Nazareth, <laughs> about how he will never do that again. And uh, apparently he didn't. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. And I love this verse 52 of chapter 2 in Luke. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. So I want to talk a little about these prophecies uh, that came to be. And I want to kind of begin at the end there and then work back up uh, toward what Simeon had to say. I really like this, what Jesus had, uh, what, what Luke gives us about how Jesus grew from that point on. Uh, just this past Thursday, uh, 
I attended a service, um, a memorial service for a good friend's wife who passed away a month ago. Uh, Harold Miller, uh, I had him speak here in September. Do you remember Harold? Great guy. Uh, he and I get together, I don't know, a handful of times a year and talk theology and drink his green tea and have a good time. Uh, and I love this guy. Um, and so his wife, who struggled with Alzheimer's for several years, uh, finally succumbed. And he had a service uh, for her, which he orchestrated. And Har Harold is incredibly gifted um, in terms of his writing capacity and creativity, and the service reflected that. But one of the things I wanted to share that he shared at this, uh, at this memorial service had to do with yearbooks. Not only was Harold a pastor, a bivocational Redwood Baptist Church for many years, uh, but he was also a uh, principal at Redwood Middle School. Some of you may have even gone to Redwood Middle School uh, when he was the principal there. Uh, and while he was there, uh, he got to know the staff and the teachers well, of course, and he, he says in the service, we knew there was one day of the entire year where we knew there were going to be no problems at all. It was the last day of school, but it wasn't because it was just the last day of school and kids were ready to get out. It's because on the last day of school, that's the day they handed out the yearbooks. And they knew that no kid would want to miss out on that yearbook moment. Remember when you were a kid? You got your yearbook and everybody just became focused. First looking through it, just recapturing the memories, making sure they got your name spelled right, make sure they picked the right picture and you didn't look like an idiot in there. Uh, looking for how many times you show up in the yearbook, maybe all these things. And then after everybody thumbed through them, what happens? Yeah, you sign them, you pass them around, you ask friends who were with you that year uh, to sign, maybe jot a little note. Uh, some of you got really good and really fast at writing, hey, you're super cool, have a good summer, and called it good. Because <laughs> sometimes they were that shallow, uh, even if well-meaning and honest. But sometimes uh, you would give it to somebody uh, who was more eloquent and thoughtful a dearer friend, and they would write a paragraph, or if it was Stephen Corley, two paragraphs. <laughs> uh, thoughtful, deep, rich, beautiful stuff of friendship. Uh, and those things you carry with you. Meaningful, deep, rich moments. Things to treasure. They're there in ink as long as you keep that yearbook. Things we gift each other with. Celebrating time shared together, the good and the bad. So Harold said, our lives are really like writing in other people's yearbooks when we live our lives in community. It's like how we treat each other is writing something in their yearbook that's a part of their life. I thought, what a beautiful way to think about that. And as I was listening to that, knowing what I was going to be talking about today, I couldn't help but think that Jesus grew in stature and wisdom and in favor with God and with other people. And I thought, you know, for the most part, for the most part, whoever Jesus talked to, whoever he was with, they not only heard good news, they experienced good news. Because for the most part, when Jesus interacted with people, it was very good news. It was God incarnate. They knew that they were cared for. They knew they were treated with dignity and respect. Many of these people, by the way, had never been uh, treated with dignity and respect. Prostitutes, tax collectors, lepers, people born with some kind of illness or disfiguration or something, people who'd been cast off by everybody else. Jesus had no problem coming alongside, loving, welcoming, healing, teaching, embracing. That's Jesus. And so one of my questions for you is, who are you becoming in 2018? Are you going to become more like that, knowing that we write in people's yearbooks? And knowing that we have a world that has learned to be very cynical and cold and harsh in language with each other. And we see that uh, all around us. We see it in our politicians on both sides of the aisle, speaking harshly, coldly, with no dignity whatsoever, no charity whatsoever toward each other. Why? Because they're reflecting the very culture that they are trying to lead. We're used to it. We see it in Facebook posts. We see it in headlines. 
And I'm wondering if that's really who we want to be. Because I want to be more like Jesus, who grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. In other words, more aligned with God and in favor with other people. Not just saying good news, but being good news. I think that's a beautiful thing, and it's compelling. And I'm wondering how you're going to do that and why you're going to do that. And I think, I think there's a piece here that we've got to at least recognize for a moment to realize that it's a choice. And I particularly want to challenge you uh, who this is not obvious to. Some of you are really hungry right now in your spiritual journey for good reasons. Things have happened that are positive, and you want to grow with those. Like something sparked your attention, and you want to grow in your understanding of God and faith and all this. And so you hear I'm doing this course, like, oh, I can't wait for this kind of stuff. And you're all in for that, and you're hungry for it. Some of you have been brought to your knees by challenges, and you're hungry for anything of God because of that. But I'm going to guess that there are maybe one or two of you that are completely comfortable <laughs> complacent in your faith and you're feeling like you kind of got it dialed in and here's what I want to tell you there's more beauty in you there is more beauty in you to behold because you're created in the image of God and it is no burden to become more beautiful in the way that God created you to be it's a privilege do you want that? You want more beauty, which means saying yes to that beauty means letting go of things that are not as beautiful. Do you want to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and others? Because it's your possibility. All of you. So so there's that. But then I was reminded of Simeon's uh, prophecy. And it made me wonder, what can we expect as those who follow Jesus? Because what Simeon had to say about Jesus was kind of a mixed bag, wasn't it? Uh, A lot of people are going to come and experience God, but you're also going to cause a lot of people to fall in Israel. A lot of people are going to love what this kid has to say. A lot of people are going to hate what this kid has to say. And Mary, a sword is going to pierce your own soul. It's going to be that painful. I, I think sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking that Christianity and following Jesus is more like a Hallmark card or a Hallmark movie when it really isn't. Remember a few weeks ago, was it just last week, I talked about the narrow way and the wide way, and Jesus himself said, the way to life is narrow. If you find it, it's hard, it's difficult, because it's different. Well, what if we know that going in? What if we know that if we really want to experience this thing that God has in mind for us, it's going to have its challenges. It's going to be awesome in respects. So it's going to create beauty. It's going to help with the redemptive cause of God. But, but if we really think about Jesus, it means that the good news is going to be bad news for some people. And we know that was the case for Jesus. I don't think Jesus was ever a jerk. I think there's one chapter in Matthew that he comes pretty close where he is just so ticked off <laughs> that, uh, that he just gets in the face of the people who were famous for being jerks. It's the only people he's ever jerky with are the jerks in society. And he got strong with them, very, very strong. Everybody else he wasn't. But that reminds us that if we're really going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, even as graceful as we can be, Sometimes light shining into darkness causes those who live in darkness to squeal. Remember when you were a kid, those of you who were my age at least, or or older, and there'd be a film strip in uh, elementary school. Remember film strips? (laughs) They'd turn off the lights and you'd watch the film strip. And as soon as the film strip was done, somebody would turn on the lights and everybody would do what? Ah! Right? Because the light came in and hurt their eyes because they were used to the darkness. There are a lot of people that are used to the darkness. And some of the people that are used to the darkness are the ones who are keeping it dark. You know, this whole thing with Me Too, the hashtag Me Too, is an evidence of people who are saying, oh, we're going to shine a light on this thing. And it's no surprise that people who have experienced the light shining on them who've been hiding in the darkness squeal. Well, I wonder if there are some situations that you're in right now. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's in your workplace system or your family system 
where you know there's something that needs to be redeemed there, something that's not quite right, that if Jesus were right there, Jesus would be doing something in an incredibly graceful, loving way to bring redemption to whatever that thing is that's not good, not healthy, not light, but dark. And I wonder if, if we know that following Jesus is part of what it means to be a Christian, obviously, I wonder if we know that going in, that if we would take a look at those systems that we're a part of and actually start to be like Jesus to bring healing, to bring redemption, to bring light into those places. I think that is our calling. I think that's what we're supposed to do as Jesus followers. I think what we don't like is what happens after we do. Because some of the people are not going to be real happy uh, that we have chosen the pursuit of redemption that we flipped on the lights, even as graceful as we can do it. And yet, that's what we're called to. So I'm wondering, what do you want to do with your 2018? And what can we expect as people who want to follow Jesus, want to see the world become a better place, more whole? What does that really mean going into it? What areas do you already know need to be redeemed? They're going to be tough. They're going to find some squealing when you flip the light switch on. I don't know. Before we do communion, I do have one final uh, thing I want to share with you about the word yes. This came up in a devotional I was reading uh, yesterday morning. And it's uh, quite compelling and beautiful. And I thought it was helpful to me, and it might be helpful for you, because today is really about saying yes. Faith in God is not just faith to believe in spiritual ideas. It's to have confidence in love itself. It's to have confidence in reality itself. At its core, reality is okay. God is in it. God is revealed in everything. Faith is about learning to say yes to the moment right in front of you. Only after you say your yes do you recognize that Christ is there in this person, in this event. God is in all things. This universal presence is available everywhere. Most of us learn to say no without the deeper joy of yes. We were trained to put up with all the dying and just take it on the chin. He says when he entered uh, his version of seminary, uh, he was in a Catholic uh, tradition, we still had whips for self-flagellation in our cells. <laughs> well, saying no to the false self does not necessarily please God or please anybody, and surely not you. There is too much resentment and self-pity involved in this kind of false dying. There is a good dying, and there is a bad dying. Good dying is unto something bigger and better. Bad dying profits nobody. It is too much no and not enough yes. You must hold out for yes. Don't be against anything unless you are much more for something else that is better. I want you to be you, all of you. Your best you is what true lovers say to one another, not, I don't like this about you, or why don't you change that? God tries to first create a joyous yes inside you, far more than any kind of no. Then you have become God's full work of art. And for you, love is now stronger than death, and Christ is surely risen in you. Love and life have become the same thing. Just saying no is resentful dieting, whereas finding your deepest yes and eating from that table is a spiritual banquet. You see, death and no are the same thing. Love and yes are even more the same thing. The true self does what it really loves and therefore loves whatever it does. You are called not to just be no. <laughs> You're called to a resounding yes toward beauty, redemption, who you were created to be. And you're called to a yes to offer the same thing to the world that needs it. So we're going to pray for a moment, give you a chance to figure this out, and then we're going to do communion. So first, let's pray. as you uh, have your eyes closed, that's just for your focus. As you breathe deep again. We take a moment and we thank God 
for the many good things that happened in 2017. And we thank you, God, that you were with us through it all, through all the highs, all the joys. And we remember, God, that 2017 had its share of pain and struggle, heartache, grief, agony even. We are grateful that you are with us still. We confess that we didn't always see you. We didn't even know you were there at times. Sometimes we even said you weren't there. But in fact, you were. And we're grateful that you made up for our weakness and gave us hope in the midst of despair. So God, we, we look for you now and the joys to come in 2018. And we look for you now and the pain and the struggle that will be a part of 2018. None of us are immune to it. But on a much deeper level, God, we who are here to hear understand an invitation is before us. An invitation to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, which is to walk hand in hand with God, to be led by the Spirit, to be redeemed and as we are, to redeem what we see that needs to be redeemed around us and get on with it. And your invitation to follow is, is a challenge. A challenge to more beauty, but beauty that means discomfort. So we take pause. And in response to your invitation and our silent prayer, we choose to give you our answer as best we can. God, for those of us who have no idea what that means, I pray that we'll be in pursuit of what it means. For those of us who said, nope, I can't do that, I pray that we'll wonder why and figure out why. For those of us who've said yes, we've chosen to dare greatly in that regard. I pray that we will sense you with us every step of the way, especially when it's tough, because it will be. And we will thank you for the incredible work that you do right before our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to do communion, and uh, there's one thing you have to do at your tables to make that happen. You need to pour some of that bubbly. So pour some of that bubbly, uh, share it around, and then we'll wait for my cue on what we're going to do. Chris, you can bring up the next screen. Pour me one, too, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. off on eating and drinking until we do it together. You can. Everybody got some? Yeah, steal some from another table if you want. Or in Stephen's case, if he just wants another one, that's fine. <laughs> so, we raise a glass together. And we recognize that in 2017, God was with us. He was with us in the bad and the good. And we're together as we move into 2018. And so for that, we thank God that God has already made the way, already said, I'm with you no matter what. So to that, we cheer to God and to community. And we recognize the original bread, the original uh, cracker uh, that was used in this event. Uh, was a symbol of brokenness. It was going to be hard. It was going to be difficult. And we recognize that. That the way of Jesus is tough. But we also know there's a sweetness to it. In Hebrews, the writer didn't say Jesus was miserable to do what he did. He said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. 
and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. It is for the joy set before us that we choose to look for the sweet and what will be a challenge. So take and enjoy. finish our time together as the band comes up and I'd actually like you to stand this is the prayer it's a model prayer that Jesus gave his disciples when they asked how should we pray it's a good one to memorize but it was never meant to be just a standalone prayer it was meant to give you a framework for understanding how to pray it's organized to help you do that but for today Let's just remember it together because this is the prayer that Jesus prayed and invites us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.